ask him today, he'll just tell you that he was a soldier getting the job done and taking care of his troops. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, retired Army Colonel Jimmy Blackman. Jimmy. Thanks, sir. Appreciate that. Well, good afternoon. It is an incredible honor to be here. You know, I, I get to travel the world and talk about the leadership lessons that I learned over 30 years of leading America's sons and daughters. But this one was unique. When I first received the call from Vince uh, several months ago, uh, I assumed initially another client and uh, go speak, uh, give some leadership lessons learned, get to talk about our soldiers, which of course I am thrilled to be able to do, honored to be able to do. Um, but as I dove into this, I found that there was much more to it than I could have initially imagined. Men and women, let me tell you, there ain't nothing more disgusting than a man to stand and read from his own book. <clears throat> but, but I'm going to do it. Because, and I've never done this, frankly. Um, I've never done this. But the things that I've seen in the video today and the things that I've heard, uh, I think are exactly what this foundation is about. So just bear with me one second here. I did not write this book to try and etch a tiny footnote in history about something I did. I wrote it to ensure that a handful of America's sons and daughters whose history would have otherwise been ignored are remembered. At the writing of this book, our combat mission in Afghanistan had just ended. After 13 years of war, America's longest war will not soon be forgotten, but the men and women who fought it will fade with time to nothing more than serial numbers on a roster press between pages if we allow it. The story I have told demonstrates that this war was fought by everyday Americans, men and women from any town USA. They came from wealthy and poor families alike. Their mothers and fathers were doctors, lawyers, mechanics, and mill workers. They had PhDs and GEDs. They were black, white, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, Samoan, and Latino. They were all extraordinary. And that's in May of 2008, I took over as the, the commander, the CEO of the 7th Squadron, 17th U.S. Cavalry up at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I knew when I became the new leader of that organization in May that in January I would be deploying them to eastern Afghanistan to the valleys where the attacks of 9-11 were planned and rehearsed. I understood how volatile it was. I had already spent two years in Iraq, and, and uh, I had seen a lot of fighting, but I was unfamiliar with the battlefield in Afghanistan. So in May, I take charge, and in July, I'm to travel to Afghanistan to do a leader's reconnaissance, visit the unit that's already there on the battlefield, and then see some, a few lessons learned, and as the boss, hopefully gather a couple of notes that I can come back and try to put a few final touches on our training before it's planes, trains, and automobiles to Afghanistan. So I'm the new leader. I have met my middle managers. I've met my staff, but I don't know them. I don't have a relationship with them. I don't understand their potential, their experience, their judgment. Something that we as leaders should know about all of our people, but that can only be gained through time. Spending time, valuable quality time with them, developing those re relationships and evaluating potential. And so I'm the fellow in that picture I like to tell about, his name is Azad Abraham Zaida. He's a dear friend of mine. Azad is Persian. He was born in Iran. In, two, in 1977, during the Iranian Revolution, they closed the borders of Iran. Oz was three years old. His father was a mathematician and engineer, and he was in Europe at the time. Oz's mother sold everything she owned, including her wedding band, and she put that three-year-old boy on her hip and took off on foot. She made it from Iran to Frankfurt, Germany. A gun was held her head three times, and all of her, everything she owned stolen, but she made it. She reunited with her husband. They immigrated to California. And when he was 17 years old, Oz enlisted in the United States Army and became a Special Forces medic. He was with us in 2009. Oz is six foot four, 270 pounds, about 8% body fat, and speaks three languages, 
When he knocks on your door at 2 o'clock in the morning, you've had a bad night <laughs> for a year. I was on the end of that bee hut, the door here, and directly across from me was the flight surgeon from 217, the unit we were visiting. The flight surgeon slept in his uniform every night of that deployment. He laid on his cot, put his boots by the bed, and had a little Motorola radio that he carried with him everywhere he went and laid by his head at night. Anytime a nine-line medevac call would come in that we had someone wounded, that Motorola radio would crackle to life. He would listen to it, and he would make a decision whether he needed to race to the helicopter before it took off or let a, a flight medic go. Now, the reason for that is in Iraq, because it's a flat desert, we were spread throughout that country with surgical teams. If you were wounded in battle, we could have you from the point of injury on a surgeon's table in about 15 minutes. That was our standard, about 15 minutes from point of injury to a surgeon's table. But in Afghanistan, you saw those pictures. You saw those mountains. We were dispersed throughout that country in large distances. And so you could be on the back of a medical evacuation helicopter for 30 to 40 minutes sometimes. If you need paralytics, narcotics, a vent tube, you have multiple tourniquets on, you need a surgeon, not a medic. And so he would listen to the call and make a determination. Well, that July morning, as I lay there uh, trying to get a few hours of sleep, I heard two feet hit the floor, floor in that wooden bee hut, and I woke up. I could hear the radio crackling, but I couldn't understand what was being said, but I heard him frantically fighting to get his boots on. The only two words I heard were as he ran through the door by my cot, and I heard the words, mass casualty, which meant we had a lot of casualties somewhere. I pulled some shorts on, and I went into their operations center to observe what was going on. I, I stood against the back wall and watched. It was a flurry of activity. It was just as it was getting gray, first light outside. There had been an attack further north, about 35 minutes' time of flight in the Apache gunships. And 48 American soldiers were fighting for their life. It had happened right in the middle of the shift change brief from the night cruise to the day cruise for the Apache gunships. Now, when we got into a fight with the enemy, generally once we got artillery in, once we got the Apaches in, got the Air Force dropping some bombs, we could pretty quickly turn the tide of the battle. We would overwhelm them with American firepower. But this was not any ordinary attack. This was two to three hundred highly trained fighters, foreign-led, that had done their homework and knew that they could take this position. As he I always said, liked to take up for the underdog, he said. Chris McKaig in high school, his father moved him to Oregon. He fell in love with the outdoors. His dad bought him a bow and arrow and let him practice with it till he thought he was good enough to hunt and then let him go deer hunting. He told me that's what it was like that morning. He said, you know, sir, we had been anticipating an attack for days. We knew it was coming. And frankly, that was worse than most of the attacks themselves, wondering when it might come, not knowing, eerie quiet every morning when you're expecting to be hit. He and his buddy Ayers had taken rocks and they had stacked them up in a little half moon position up there on topside and they were laying behind those rocks. He said, every one of us, 100%, laying on our belly, weapons oriented outside the position, night vision goggles on our helmet. And he said, I thought, this is like deer hunting. I'm looking for anything out of the ordinary, something that doesn't belong, any movement. But he didn't see anything. He said, in fact, it was incredibly quiet. And he said, there was just enough light in the sky that I thought I could see with the naked eye. So Chris McKay reached up to his night vision goggles and he pulled them away from his head. And he said, the second they separated from my helmet, the entire valley erupted in heavy machine gun and RPG fire. Immediately an RPG impacted just above him and the one below him. He said, my entire body was lifted off the ground and slammed back down. He said, I looked into the rocks above me and it looked like ants crawling through the rocks coming down from the high ground. They were everywhere. And he said, for the first time in my life, I felt fear in a commanding way. He said, the overwhelming urge to curl up in a ball behind those rocks we had piled up was almost more than I could overcome. He said, I told myself, I wasn't trained for this. They didn't train me for this, not this. But perhaps it was the training that kept Chris McKaig returning fire, trying to fight back. 
He looked at his buddy Ayers and he said, we've got to work together. They were hunkered down nose to nose, adrenaline rage, sweating behind those rocks. And Ayers said, I know. He said, look, let's raise up. I'll take from 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock. You take from 12 to 3. We'll fire eight or nine rounds at these guys and then duck back down. We've got to work together to fight them off. And Ayers said, okay. And Chris McCaig counted. One, two, three. Three. Up they raised, eight to nine rounds, bodies crawling everywhere through the rocks back down. Again, one, two, three, up, firing again and back down again. One, two, three, up. And the third time they came back down and Chris said, Ayers looked like what you would think if I said he saw a ghost. He was pale white, his eyes were big. And then Ayers coughed and what seemed like a cup of blood came up. The bullet had hit him just below the collarbone, just above the body armor. And Ayers was dead in less than 20 seconds. Ayers is dead, Chris McKegg screamed. But he said, I couldn't even hear my own voice for the sound of the battle. And then he heard something that he said seemed so out of place, so strange, because I just screamed that Ayers was dead and couldn't hear myself. But suddenly I heard bodies crawling in the rocks just in front of my position and heard whispering in a foreign language. So Chris McCaig peeked out from around the rocks, and he saw an enemy fighter tangled in the barbed wire just in front of his position, directly in front of his Claymore anti-personnel mine. He ducked back down, grabbed the firing device. All he had to do was squeeze it. It would send an electrical charge through the wire to the mine, and the mine would blow on the enemy soldier. He said, I was just about to squeeze it, and something in me said... No, you have to know that you've eliminated the threat. You have to know you've killed him. You've got to look. And so cheating death again, he peeked out from behind the rocks and he squeezed the firing device and he said, I saw that enemy soldier take the full force of that Claymore mine in slow motion. I saw shoes fly from the dead man's feet, he said. In the first 10 minutes of the battle, Every soldier in OP topside were killed or wounded. Over the next four to five hours, we got the Apaches there. We got artillery in. We got the Air Force in. And we finally got a quick reaction force, more reinforcements in. But of the 48 men at, at one night, 27 were wounded and nine were killed that day. And I sat in that operations center and saw this unfold. And I felt the weight and responsibility of leadership as I had never felt it before in my life. As I said, That's the question I ask myself. Are we ready for this? And have I done everything I can to prepare my soldiers? And the answer I knew was probably not. Remember, I was the new boss. They were a great organization, a great company. But I didn't know them. Not as I needed to, because I was not going to stand at a, at a memorial and know I had the wrong person in the wrong seat on the bus on the wrong mission. As a leader, that was my responsibility, to know that we at least maximize the potential. Knowing bad things can happen, but getting it as good as we could with the information we had and the understanding of the people within our organization. As I said before, it doesn't matter what organization you lead. It's about maximizing the potential of everyone in it thus maximizing the organization's potential. It's about inspiring human behavior. You see, I came to realize that I had a piece of information that was pretty important. It was pretty powerful to me. And that was, I was the leader. I was responsible. But I didn't have all the answers to the complex problems that we faced. But I knew I was surrounded by incredibly talented and bright young men and women the ones we've been talking about today. The question was, had I as a leader set an environment within that organization where they would be willing to share their ideas? They would throw their ideas on the table, knowing that not all of them are going to work, but feel safe, feel that trust in the organization to say, what if we try this? Can we try that? You have the wrong culture in your organization. I don't care what you do. If it's not safe to throw out ideas, knowing some may be good, some may be bad, you will not receive initiative, innovation, ideas within your organization. You want to inspire human so behavior. You can't do that digitally. That is a human being to human being ordeal. 
Trust is gained. Leader to lead and lead to leader. You understand the potential of the people within your organization when you take the time to not just hear them, but understand them. That's where you get buy-in in leading organizations. This organization turned out, it was a tough year. You'll read about it. We lost 35 soldiers on the ground. I had pilots shot to pieces. But we came back and became the most decorated unit in Army aviation history. The first unit to win the, both the Combat Army Aviation uh, Unit of the Year and the LSD Parker Aviation Unit, Combat Aviation Unit of the Year Award. We had the Flight Surgeon of the Year, the Air Sea Land Rescue Hoist of the Year. We had the Sheet Metal Repairer of the Year. We had the Electrician of the Year, the Flight Surgeon of the Year. Why? Not because Jimmy Blackman turned a single wrench, pumped a gallon of gas. Jimmy Blackman didn't render life-saving aid in the middle of a battle to anybody. Jimmy Blackman didn't do any of that. All I did was create an environment where those young men and women could be themselves. That was already within them. They fill the organizations you lead as well. And that's what we as leaders have to ask ourselves. Have we created an environment where we're, we're getting the best out of them? the best version of them. I'll share one last story with you. That's the leadership that I grew up under, I told you. It was, a, it was incredible leadership for that era, for that World War II generation. It's what won the war for us. It was very directive. We were a nation mobilized for war. But I found that this was what was needed in this post-9-11 war that we were in. A lot more arm around the shoulder and and direct leadership. This is none other than Christopher McKaig, who lost his buddy Ayers. This was Chris's third deployment after the Battle of Wanat. A white male in his 60s and a young African-American male in his 20s that met that morning could create that powerful a bond because they invested in one another. We're all busy. We all get tied up doing various things across technology. Don't ever forget that life is and always will be about people and relationships. This is Og's rule to live by. Beginning today, treat everyone you meet as if they were going to be dead by midnight. Extend to them all the care, kindness, and understanding you can muster and do it with no thought of any reward. Your life will never be the same again. I think that's what you're trying to do in this foundation. Make a difference in the lives of people. May God bless you for all you do for this and your various other endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please.